Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I think, you know, I'm an R beginner. I've been working my way through the book for quite a while now, but I've not actually used R in real life. So you have to sort of bear with me. Yeah, um, no these slides are based on chapter 13, but I haven't exactly followed the structure of the chapter. I, I've sort of put it in an order that felt logical to me. So again, hopefully it'll make sense. Um, and I've had a go at all the exercises as well. So depending on time at the end, we can maybe go through some of those just to see what happens. Yep. So this chapter is all about relational data. So when you've got multiple tables of data and it's more about the relationships between them, than the individual data sets that are important. So they say in the book that actually it's very rare in real life that you'd just be working with one data table. Usually you need to take things from different sources and bring them together. Um, so the relations are that link that's formed between a variable in one table and a corresponding variable in a different one. So in this diagram, all the arrows are showing links between different variables. So they're showing the relations. Um, and right the way through this chapter, it uses the flights data that we've seen before. And then it's got some related tables. So we've got airlines, which has, we've got the carrier code, I think it is in the flights table. And then the airlines lets us look up what the actual names are. Um, in airports, we can see information about the actual airports. So what they're called, where they're based. Um, you've got planes, which has got things like what type of plane they are who the manufacturer is, all linked up by the tail number, and then weather is self-explanatory, but that's the weather at each of the airports for each of the relevant um, hours. And so you can see that all these connections are on there. So flights can connect to planes using tail number because that's in both of them. Similarly, airlines connects to flights through the carrier. With the airports one, because it's got all the airports in there, it might connect to flights via origin, or we might want to do the destination, depending on what we're looking at. And then for weather, it connects via the combination of the year, month, day, hour, and origin of the flight. So, to start working with these relations, then there are, there's a verb family within dplyr. So, We've got mutating joins, which, and it took me embarrassingly long to understand this, but dply I mutate, right? So it's adding columns on, it's like mutate. So it's taking two different tables, looking at where they link up and then adding the variables from the second table into the first. In the same vein, dplyr again, we've got filtering joins. So they're looking and where the variables don't match up, they're not coming through. So it's allowing you to filter observations based on whether they match in the other table and then there's also these set operations which are less frequently used but they're all about comparing every variable in a row if you've got two inputs with the same variables um, and we'll come back to all of these different ways of working with pairs of table in a minute but for all of these joins you need to be able to identify the keys so that's what I've focused on first so the key is that variable or set of variables that uniquely identifies an observation. So when it's in its own table, it's the primary key. And an example of that is when you're in the planes data, you've got the tail number. So that's the unique observation within there. The foreign key identifies it in another table. So when you're in the flights data set, tail number in there is actually a foreign key because that's what you would use to uniquely identify the observation by matching it up with the planes table. So it's not unique in the flights data, but it can be used to match up with a different unique observation, if that makes sense. Um, and so as we saw, it's not necessarily a single variable. It could be a combination. So we saw that in that weather table, you'd need to combine year, month, day, hour, and origin to get unique observations, but that's fine. It can work with those in just the same way. Um, and then there are some tables that don't have a primary key. So the flights table doesn't really seem to have anything, you know, you, the tail number you might think would be unique if you combined it with the, the day or things like that, but, but it's not. So in that case, and certainly when you're going to be doing more work and filtering and you might need to be able to reference back, the suggestion is to add in your own surrogate key, which is just a sort of reference number that you can use for your own analysis. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Ruth, how can you create a surrogate key using MeTech as a number? So I, my understanding is you're basically creating a new variable using mutate and the row number bit will just literally start at the top and do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So then your primary key is just the row number of the observation, if that makes sense. And Alan, if that's the right interpretation. Yeah, yeah. In, in this sense, basically, that's it. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure about the, uh, the, the application um, for, for, for the row number, for example, if you have another table and you're also creating the row number there, then you need to sort of like be sure that each row number is actually identifying the same kind of information. Um, yeah. but, but, but for this case, you could actually maybe just take the number, you could turn the time variable, uh, which is time hour, maybe. Uh, you you yeah. could combine two variables, I think. Okay, so cool. The time number so, and uh, something else. So if you have your data, some data, and it doesn't have any key, you can create a surrogate key by like, I mean, adding like mutate, you open bracket and maybe say ID equals to row number and close the bracket, right? It can automatically create a new column with IDs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Um, so. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah, my question goes to this, this example you show. So after filter, we can add another five and say mutate open bracket ID equals to row number and close. And that will create the surrogate key, right? And uh, no. no. Yeah, I mean, um, um, Ruth, do you have your R studio? Can you run this code and try to create the surrogate key? You're testing me here, aren't you? Um. <laughs> you can do this, yeah, I want to be sure <laughs> because it's just clearly I read. So, yeah. So, okay, let me just pop down to the bottom here. So, we're saying we've got the flight state. It's the flights one that doesn't necessarily have um, an intuitive primary key. Yeah. So, we're saying we would take the flights data and we mutate. Yeah. And ID equals ID. row number. Mm -hmm. No, it's not right row number. It's not correct the way you wrote it, right? It's just a little bit of an underscore uh, row underscore number. Okay. Yep, that's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So typically it's gone off the edge of the page. We'll just try it with the streamlined one. No, it's not got it. That's in the other file. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Have you run it? It's having a good think about it. Yeah, it's really huge. If this doesn't work, I'll get the flights to code from the other. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my own end, I mean, the, the code from your slide, it works that way, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so it's loaded up now. <laughs> so there we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I think, yeah, if we were then gonna start messing around with this, filtering it or whatever, and needed to maybe have some way to cross-reference back with the original data so that we could find which row we were looking at, that mm -hmm. might be good practice. Mm -hmm. Cool? Yeah. Right. So it's good to see <laughs> in our studio <laughs> you're just testing me so um so once you've you think you've found your primary key so it's good practice to check that it really is unique and um, so it's given us this little bit of code so we think that tail number is the primary key for the planes table so we're just counting them and checking to see if there are any of them where there's more than one and sure enough there aren't any so we know that we're safe with that 
Um, and that's not to say that duplicate keys are always a problem. So if we're using, if we're trying to look up data in a different table, it may well be that we have duplicates. And I'm sure I'd thought about an example on this. So even though the tail number isn't unique in the flight data table, for example, we could use that as a primary key to then bring across information from the planes table. Um, so that would work then. But if we've got duplicate keys in both tables, that usually means something's gone wrong. Um, so, and then quickly just gonna look at how you tell the join which key columns to use before we look at the joins themselves. Yeah, Luke, I have a question, please. Go back to the previous slide. Okay. So how can we identify if like tail number is not a primary key if we run this call? So we're checking to see if it's unique. So if we'd run this and it returned saying one of the tail numbers was in the table two, three times, then we know it's not uniquely uh -huh. identifying uh -huh. it within that table. Okay. So here, because it's zero times, right? So yeah. All right, cool. You can move on. Yeah. Cool. So, so yeah, so when we're defining those columns to use for the join, so the default is just nothing. Um, and R will look for this natural join where it'll identify all variables that are there in both tables. So with this, we're saying flights two, which is just a streamlined version of flights, because as we just saw, flights is really wide. Um, so flights two, we want to join it up with the weather data. We've not specified what we want to join it on, but R does the work and it sees that year, month, day, hour and origin are in both. And so it matches on those and it returns our flights two data table with some of the weather data added towards the right. So that's if we don't tell it what to join by. Um, then we might wanna specify, we want to use one variable that's got the same name in both tables. So here again, we've got that flights to data set, actually getting rid of another couple of columns just for ease. And we want to join it with the airlines data and we're telling it to look at the carrier because that's, that's the, variable that's in both tables. So you can see it's then used the flights data and it's matched up the carrier from the flights data and brought across the name from the airlines table. Or we can use a character vector. So like a natural join, but we might only want to use some of the common variables. So the example here is that the flights data set and the planes data set, they both have year in there but they mean different things because in the flights, it's the year of the flight. And in the planes, I think it's the year that the plane was built, I'm assuming, I haven't actually checked. Um, so we're saying don't do the natural join because you'll try and join on the year as well and we don't want that. So we're specifying join on the tail number. And so again, we get the flights data and then it started to add the planes data on the end. And it quite helpfully uses the little suffix, the X and the Y so that we can see that year's in there twice, but we know that year X is the one from the flights data table, whereas year dot Y is the one from the planes data table. Um, and then the last way is to use a named character vector to match the variable A in table X to variable B. So the good example for this is for the airports table, which can match up to flights on either the origin airport or the destination airport. So we're specifying here, join it to airports and, and use the column, use the variable origin, match that up with FAA, which is the airport code, which is in the airports data. So it's gone in and it's used the origin code there and matched it up. So we know that the data, like the latitude and longitude data that's come across from the airports table is relating to the origin rather than to the destination. It would have worked equally well if we'd said destination there. So we've got to specify which one we want. Does that all make sense in terms of defining the columns to use for the join? Yeah. Can you come on again for the last one? This one, <laughs> a little bit lost. What, just go through it again? Yeah, this one, this one. This yeah? One. Yeah. So the airports table has got all 
information about airports like their name and, and where they are so that could match up with either the destination or the origin column in the flights table um, so we're specifying that we want it in this case we want it to bring across the name of the origin airport um, not explaining it very well and I can't think of a different way to say it yeah that's right it's okay yeah I see yeah so yeah okay. what is FAA it's just the the airport code so like EWR LGA I don't know what it stands for but it's just that little code okay so this origin this FAA um, actually um, matches this description in the origin column right yeah okay perfect yeah, because I was a little bit worried like what this FAA does because I couldn't see it like in the table or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I I it's it's a weird little code, isn't it? I don't know what it stands for. Yeah. Okay. So then moving on to the joins themselves then. So we've got mutating joins, which was where you can combine the variables from two different tables. So it's matching them by the keys and then copying variables across. And there are a few different kinds of mutating joins, but the simplest one is the inner join. So it's got these little diagrams in the book. I've put loads of them in here because they were really helpful for me. But just tell me if they don't make sense to anyone else. Um, but basically, so mutating join. So yep. what that the left join is it not mutating join? Left join is a kind of mutating join. Yeah, we'll come on to it on the next slide. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the inner join looks, and so if we think of the coloured columns as the keys, um, it's looking between those keys and saying, all right, yep, I can match up on one, I can match up on two, but I can't match this three. So it's just returning the ones that do match, and that's what the inner join does. Um, and that's how it works sort of in the code. So we're saying, got X, inner join it to Y based on the key column, which is the coloured column, and it just returns as X1, X2 an x3 mm. that's not right is it <laughs> why is it returning x3 that's odd yeah that's not right that's not right so just pretend the bottom row is not there and that's right and we'll move on quickly so yep. um so outer joints as you mentioned left join it sits here so these are different kinds of mutating joins so here it's not about matching everything it's keeping observations that appear in at least one of the tables um, and the clues sort of in the name so for a left join it keeps all the observations in the left table in x so it's matched up one it's matched up two can't match any more but it's still got three in there the right join keeps all observations in y so that's down here and then a full join keeps both of them um, regardless of whether they're in the other table and so the code for that is down here and that works just the same. You could replace full join with left join or right join. Um, and that's how it works. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think um, uh, when I read the book, um, there was a kind of session where he made mention like, um, he recommend um, using right join in all situations. I don't know what that means. It's <laughs> left join. Yeah, I should have said that. Yeah, he says treat that as your default join and only use yeah. another one if you've got like a really good reason not to. Which one, left or right? Left. Are you sure? Oh, because I was like a little bit confused. Like he said right, I say why right? <laughs> no, it's, it's left, it's left join. Oh, it's left. Mainly because, so, and I, 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 I agree with him on that. Because from my previous experience, I've only I've mainly used left join like about ninety percent of the time. Uh, mainly because you have always a data set. Then you're like you ask yourself, okay, I want to add some more variables, some more variables on this data set, but these variables are in another data set. So always you you have something like like yeah. in case the x and on the x is on the left, and you want to add on something. Whatever you want to add on is considered as something on the on the right. So it just makes sense that you're always going to consider the left join. Ideally, you could consider the right join if you switch up things. But for the logical flow of things, normally it's always going to be on the left. Um, uh, 
um, have a, why do we call the, the previous one inner join and this one outer join? Can you tell me? I don't know. Do you understand the question? Yes, but I don't know the answer. Alan, um, so the previous slide we call them inner joint, and these ones we call them outer join. Yeah. I'm thinking my head so that I can have a better, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, like I don't need to remember that if they, but what this inner and outer look like? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I think, I think Hub, Hub might have some, something to say here, uh, 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 if I say something. Yeah. But uh, so, basically, um, the, the inner is more of like um, interpreting, I interpret it as the, the intersection kind of thing. But anything else that is not inner is going to be outer. And you don't have to confuse yourself about outer because you can actually just ignore the outer bit and just take it as join. Yeah, basically, like the inner there is as you're saying the intersection so it's only the case where both like the key is present in yeah. both the tables okay. and yeah. anything other than that is an outer join and you have like left outer where you say i don't care about the things that are uniquely in my right table my right table is just additional information i want to keep everything that's in my left main table and just add anything else i can add so that's your left join keep everything in the left and add stuff from the right table right join is the opposite of that and basically the full join is i want all the data i can get and i don't mind if some of my left for example here like the x values are missing or if my y values are missing i guess it depends like what this data is and what like an na in either of the columns means i often find that i do i most often use an inner join because um like I guess it depends on like the significance of the data that you're joining. Like if your right table is just as important as your left table, mm. then a missing value in left or right, you know, it is just as meaningful, right? So I only want cases where I have both of the information, mm. but yeah, it depends. Whereas if your right table is just like, you know, optional additional information, then you could just do a left join. Um, if yeah, it depends on your use case, basically. Yeah, so in a join matches observation when they have equal keys only. Yeah, so in this case, it would have one, two, and then x1, x2, yeah. y1, y2. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It basically, so, it depends, like, it, which one you use depends on how important your left or right table is. Yeah, so if you do in a join, sometimes you may lose some information, right? Yeah. Um, I think, um, as Hadley said, the left join, maybe if you do the left join and uh, look up your data, if you don't need anything, you can remove it. But if you do the inner join, yeah, it depends on the uh, use case, right? Maybe. Yeah, exactly. So basically, an inner join is a join, and then kind of like you can think about it as both mutating and filtering. Mm -hmm. Like you're basically adding pieces of information, but also filtering your left table by your right table, right? Like a semi join. But I think, sorry, I missed like the first couple of minutes. So I don't know if this has already been mentioned. No, I think not yet. Okay, sorry, yeah. But well, we'll see it later on. Well, yeah. like the short answer is it depends how important your left and right tables are. All right, okay. And all these join, the inner join and outer join, they are all called mutating joins? Yeah. All yeah, because right. they add variables on okay. to the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Yeah, but this is specific to, I think, Duplier or R. Oh, it's specific Duplier, right? Yeah, this kind of thing is more of like what, it, what, what I think Hadley came up with just to be able to, to relate mm -hmm. it to Duplier. Yeah, all right, let's go on. OK. Um, so as how I mentioned, so then we've got the filtering joins. So these match observations, just like they would with a mutating join, but then it's affecting the observations. So it's filtering out some of the observations based on the, the result of the match. So here it's managed to match up one, it's managed to match up two, but it can't match three. So it just keeps one and two. Um, 
So we could do this, for example, if we had a file of top destination, top destinations, that's just the top 10 most popular destinations that the flights go to. So we want to filter our flights data table based on just those top destinations. Ignore head, that was just to make it fit on the page. Um, and so it would then filter flights and just show us the ones that appeared in the top destinations table. Then the opposite of that would be an anti-join. So it only keeps the rows that don't have a match. So again, one has a match, two has a match, but three doesn't. So that's the one that we're keeping. Um, so here he's pointing out that it's, it's quite interesting that actually when you look at flights, it has some tail numbers in there that aren't listed in the planes data. Not many of them, um, but, it, but a few flights but not many different tail numbers. Um, so yeah. that's particularly helpful for sort of spotting any mismatches with your joins to see what, what the problem is. Yeah, can you go back to, back to the previous slide? Yep. Me join. Um, so um, how does it work, you say? So it's comparing, comparing both data tables and where there is a match, so it'll then filter and just keep the ones where there is a match. So here where there is a match. Uh, um, when you say match, what do you mean? The key? The key? The key, yeah. So here we have one, right? And the one here we have X1 and Y1, right? Yep. Um, but the value is X1. Yeah. But the key, the key is the key is the bit that it's matching on, and then it's sort of that's the in, variable, the value. In, in the second table here, we have y one, right? The y one. So because this is a filtering join, so it's not adding it on. We're not we're not sort of trying to add that information oh, okay, into the okay, table. We just oh, want I to see, filter I the first table. Yeah, I forget. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's that, that's uh, that, that's the other reason why. It, you might not really need to use, uh, for example, um, an inner join or a left join here, because you, you're doing something extra on top of the the the, the, the inner so, join. Yeah. So this keep all observation in X that have a match in Y, right? Mm, the, yes. So, ob observations. No, the, it keeps um, a subset of the data set in X. Yeah. So. When you say match, you mean the key, not the content, right? Yeah. So it will only keep for the first table. Uh, but what about the second table? It doesn't keep, right? No. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are the filtering joins, and it does have um, in the chapter some sort of top tips or best practice for how to, to get around join problems that's probably worth a read, um, but I've not listed it here. So then the last thing is just those set operations. So what the book says is that these are used a lot less frequently, but they can sometimes be useful if you've got a, a complex filter and you want to break it down into simpler pieces. Um, I've got to be honest, this is the bit where I'm sort of struggling to think of real world examples or understand how it would help, but I'll talk through how it works. Um, so if we had two, two tables where they're the same, but the only difference is that it's two and one in data frame one and it's one and two in the second one. So the first of the set operations is intersect that will only give us the observations that are in both X and Y. So the only one in this case is the one, the first row that appears in both of them. So that's intersect. Then the second one is union. So that'll look and return, it looks across both data frames and shows you just the unique observations in both of them. So it's got the one one, but then it's also got two one and one two. Um, and then the last one is set diff, where it'll show you observations that are in X, but not in Y. Um, or you can flip the order of the data frames and it'll show you ones that are in Y, but not in X. Um, so as I say, I'm not totally sure how these are used in the real world, but I understand the theory. Um, I don't know if you have any examples. Um, 
Okay, so one time, one time I had this job, this uh, job, job thing that uh, guys were advertising. Um, basically, they were doing, they were dealing with data frames or different data sets, and they wanted to test on a constant basis uh, how the data sets actually differ. So, in, in a sense, uh, you, the data sets have the same columns, like 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 you can see right here. But uh, the, the the rows actually are different, so they could just test uh, and pick out um, the intersecting rows. What rows are similar, for example? And you could also think about it in a sense that uh, if you have if you if you have this data this data set and you're creating it with, based on the same rules, then later on in time you actually change the rules uh, that you use to create this data set. So you keep the old the old rows. Then you try to generate new rows uh, based on new rules. Then later on, you could actually happen that you want to actually go back to your original data set that you, you had without uh, the, the new rule. And maybe that, that, that could happen that you need to use this kind of thing. Uh, that, that's, that's what I've, I've thought about so far. Well, that does make sense. I think we had something where we, we were doing surveys every month and we were getting a cumulative data set and then we noticed something sneaky where things had started changing in previous months but we were never looking back at those because they were in the past so I suppose this type of thing would show us where things have changed mm. yeah okay so that's all the slides I had for the sort of content of the chapter and so then it was just whether there are any more questions on that um, or if we want to look at the exercises or anything like that. So oh, very, very good summary, I think. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Thanks. Yeah, ne never trust people who say, oh, it's going to be hard for me. I'm not so sure. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so what, what, what do you guys want to do? We could look at some of the problems. I don't know if like, yeah, yeah we can do that since we have many time, not one more time. Yeah. Yeah. We can, we can do that. Okay. So, um, I mean, some of the exercises are just sort of picking out the keys in data sets and things like that. I don't know if if everyone's done the exercises because there's probably not, those probably aren't the most helpful exercises if you've not done them, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. I don't know if there are any in particular we want to look at. Hmm. I don't think I explained that very well. There were quite a few of the exercises where you just needed to go away and kind of look at a table of data and think oh yeah okay I think that's the primary key or this is what the relation is um, yeah just 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 select one for exercise um, one or two per exercise I think that will be enough yeah and nobody's got any favorites so we just winging it here yeah, I have one favorite, but it comes later on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so the first one, it was saying if you wanted to draw the route each plane flies from its origin to its destination, what variables would you need from what tables? So we'd seen from, from that sort of diagram of all the different relations with the flights data that we'd need to take the origin and the destination. Um, so the actual airports and then match those both up with the airports table lat and long and then that would allow you to plot your origin and your destination on a map. So that's that one. Um, I guess here we'd actually need two joins, right? Like we have our sort of flights which contains the origin and the destination. So I guess first we'd need to match it based on or origin to get the latitude and longitude of the origin and then join again on the destination. To yeah. Get, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So in, in, so in this case, we would also need to, the, on the, after this pass join, we, we would need to rename the longitude and latitude. Yeah, I guess we'd give suffixes, wouldn't we? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then that, that, that could work. Or pre yeah, I, I don't know if prefixes are available, but yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I just, so the relationship between weather and airports um, it doesn't show in that diagram we looked at, and so it's asking how it should appear. So we've got the origin column in the weather data that would link to that airport code column in the airports data. Um, yeah. I struggle with this because I should probably be drawing a picture instead of describing it with words. <laughs> I think, uh, I think that I makes can... sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the origin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, should I skip on to the next set of exercises? Yeah, there's one which I didn't understand. The third one. The third one in this one about weather. Yeah. Okay, so weather only contains information for the origin airports, but if it did have records for all airports in the USA. Oh, right, okay, so I think that's where it's saying that because the weather data is limited to just the the airports in New York City, you can only match up weather with origin, but if it actually had all of the weather records, then it would also match up with the destination. That's what I thought anyway. I wonder then if we could actually draw any conclusions about like this earlier exercise we did with I think like the deep plier where we're looking at delays where we could link like it, are there more delays on rainy days or whatever things like that which would be quite interesting. Yeah, it I makes you do some of that later on. Yeah, uh, yeah I there is some exercises like that. I didn't really do it but I think there is one like that. I also found, I also thought it might be interesting. Do you want to skip to that? Which one was it? Yeah, I, I really, I don't understand this question here. Question three, it's so weird. This one, we still not got it. Um, yeah, I'm like, okay, so the only thing I'm thinking about, like, why are they talking about New York, New York City? I mean, or in whatever, New York as a state, for the origin. Because I think, I think all the, the is it because it's the NYC flights data, okay. all the flights, go from New York City. So okay. I think the weather data is just New York City weather data. Okay, okay, I see. I think, yeah. Well, okay, I get it now. Um, okay. So then got about some days of the year are special, so we might see fewer people than usual flying. How could you show that as a data frame? What would be the primary keys and how would it connect? So I thought if we had a table of every day of the year, but then a column sort of saying special, could be logical, yes or no. Um, the primary keys would be the dates. So we'd, we'd have to have the dates split up like they are in the flights data. So year, month, day format. Um, and then you could connect it to either the flights or the weather tables using the combination of, of date variables to say whether it's a special date or not. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, it's special. Oh, yeah. I'm guessing it means like Christmas there. Okay. <laughs> that was my interpretation. It doesn't actually specify. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Because like special days, it could mean so many things. It could mean that like Christmas or like uh, Thanksgiving. Or, yeah. Or it could also mean the days that really don't have anything. Because so many people can travel on, on Christmas and Thanksgiving. True, yeah. But also, like, I think there are also like special days where more people travel. Let's say like in the UK, bank holidays, I'm sure, have like um, a lot more traffic. Yeah. So special is ambiguous here. Mm. I mean, it's, it's like it's explicitly saying fewer people than usual fly on them, but like... You could have, I don't know, high traffic, low traffic days or something like that. Or yeah. like special days, sort of data frame. But mm. instead of having like true, false, you either have two columns, like, you know, higher traffic, true, false, 
Um, actually, yeah. that, that would be enough, right? Because if it's false, then it's a special day with not high traffic, so it will be low traffic. Yeah, yeah. that's another question. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I, I, I think I agree. That, that would be better. That makes more sense to me if you just uh, kind of like uh, filter out or group by, by the day and uh, get the total number of flights on that day and sort it out mm. based on some cutoff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, oh, look, we tried to do this a minute ago, didn't we? Add a surrogate key to flights. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh well never mind we've done that twice now um and then so these are the ones that are possibly not that much fun to do together now because it's installing loads of packages and then going away to read the documents to see what the keys are in different data sets i, I kind of think that's probably better to do individually mm -hmm. um so if i skip through these ones um and again, we've not looked at those, so we'll skip these. Um, so the next set of exercises then, the first one, compute the average delay by de destination, then join it on the airport's data frame to draw, uh, to show the spatial distribution. And it gives you a way to, to draw a map of the United States and it suggests using the size or color of the points to display the average delay. Um, so yeah. you'll have to forgive my lengthy code, um, but I tried doing it, uh, grouping by the destination, calculating the average delay, um, filtering any where there isn't actually a delay, joining that with the airports and then doing the map and it stressed me out because it was putting the lower values the low the shorter variables um it was showing those in the darker color so i did a bit of a fudgy fix to switch the colors around just to make it more intuitive for me um i don't know maybe that's a personal preference thing um no, no it makes it, it's a it, it, it's, it's a better practice uh in uh, visualization yeah to represent the darker colors uh, with, with the, the higher numbers with the darker color yeah um and then it also suggested you could do it by size um which i also tried i think this one's a bit messier but in some ways easier to read i guess you can really pick out some of the bigger blobs because that is intuitive yeah, you could just add the alpha there probably. But yeah. it's not needed, is it? Not needed. Nice. Um, For some reason, by the way, I was getting an error here. I couldn't do the join. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I, I gave up. I was like, oh, this is so <laughs> <laughs> That's it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Um. So... Oh, again, this is just what we were talking about, I think. So add the location of the origin and destination to flights. Um, so I've selected a subset of the columns and then left join for the origin and then also for the destination. And I've done what you were suggesting around using suffixes so that you can tell which is which. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think the internet helped me with that question. That's what the internet is for. That's nice. Then, so is there a relationship between the age of a plane and its delays? So I think, so I looked to join the flights with the planes, um, add the age in there. And then group by the age. I think when I did this, there were very few planes that were over 25 years old and it was kind of skewing things. So I just filtered um, filtered on the ones with better volumes. Uh, calculated the average delays. And again, I only wanted to see the ones where there were delays on average. Um, and then tried to put that on a graph which seemed to say that if there is a delay, then 
the length of it will increase sort of gradually until the plane's around 10 years old and then dip. Yeah. Um, there might be another rise here, but I didn't want to go above 25 years because I didn't feel there was sort of enough data for that to be kind of significant. Um, I'm also not sure if I've gone about this the right way and if that's a true pattern, but it's, it's a pretty graph. So, oh my God. weird trend yeah that's that's what sort of stopped me you would maybe expect but it could i suppose i mean we could make up anything to make it make sense but maybe they all get serviced after 10 years you know <laughs> there could be a reason couldn't there yeah. um and then yeah I, I think i think we might need to look at, at the distribution of the uh, of the flights also mm-hmm like how many flights does each dot represent? Like how reliable is each dot? Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. That's why I cut off to 25. But yeah, I could have checked mm. that a bit better as well for the others. That's true. Interesting, actually. <laughs> Never mm. expected this. Oh. Um, so then it had what weather conditions make it more likely to see a delay? Um, so with the weather only having information for the origin, I looked at departure delays rather than arrival delays. Um, I think, yeah, this was one that took a while to kind of figure out. I tried doing just a sort of binary variable, is there or isn't there a delay? Um, and then calculating the averages for each of the different weather conditions. Um, I'll see what that does. Just trying to remember what that was getting at. That's not going to. Oh, right. To sort of see if there was a big difference based on whether they had a delay or didn't have a delay. Um, but looking across, they all seemed quite close, which probably suggests I've gone about this a silly way. Um, but I then think I dived a bit further into the ones. So there was maybe the biggest percentage difference for, for rain. So then I looked at the average delay rather than just a sort of binary thing. Um, and what did this show? It showed that, yes, possibly, although again, talking about the distribution, there aren't necessarily as many over here, but possibly, you are more likely to be delayed if there's more rain. Mm -hmm. um, and I did it again for visibility, which again, possibly, because I think um, higher visibility is good. So lower visibility looks like potentially longer delays. Um, yeah. yeah. All of these are subject to what you're saying around distribution, aren't they? So, yeah, but I mean, honestly, uh, it depends because most of the flights I think are, are flown best using. Um, okay, it depends, of course, but I think most of the flights might be flown using uh, uh, visual flight rules, what they call it. Then the other, the other flight rules are instrument flight rules. So that you don't really need to be able to see to 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 land or or take off. You just need the instrument. That sounds uh, terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. But I, but I think I think most flights, uh, most airports and countries recommend uh, the the visual flight rules. I mean, I, I don't remember very well. Interesting. Um. So yeah, I, I tried to do a couple of things, but as well, I think I felt it was a bit false because technically I should be considering all of the variables, not just sort of one by one. Um, so potentially we've found some patterns, but I, I kind of left it there. Mm, um, nice. Tested the theory, right? So yeah. Um, and it had what happened on June the 13th, 2013, display the spatial pattern of delays and then use Google. So I did I use the code it gave before to make the map 
and we ended up with this. Now this time I didn't switch the colours round because when I tried it, it was a bit harder to tell, whereas the lighter blue stands out a lot more. Um, even though, so it's, yeah, it's counterintuitive, but for what I was doing to try and spot where the highest delays were, it was easier to see than when they were lighter. Just mm -hmm. a bit of a cheat. Um, and I think the biggest one that I noticed was Tennessee, and there were two, I don't even know how you say it, Derechos? I've, I've never heard of them before. Wikipedia says it's a widespread, long-lived straight-line windstorm associated with a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms. Um, and sure enough, there was one of those on the 12th, 13th, June 2013. So it kind of made sense. Yes. Do you want me to keep going or we had enough? No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so the next set of exercises, so what does it mean for a flight to have a missing tail number? Um, so when I filtered to look at those, what I noticed was that there were no departure times or arrival times. So I think it means that the flight was cancelled. Um, so then it was asking what they have in common. So I used anti-join to just look at the tail numbers that, that didn't match in planes because oh yeah what do the tail numbers that don't have a matching record in planes have in common so first I found the ones that don't have a match in planes um, and then I wanted to go back to the original data set a bit like what we we're saying with the special dates I suppose to just mark up each um, saying whether it had a matching record or not um, because I think my logic was that I might think I can find a pattern in them, but if that pattern might be the same in the full flights data set, and so it could sort of lead me up the wrong track. Um, I wonder if this will show. So, so then I was looking and saying, okay, group them by carrier and count them and show me what percentage of them are missing that's weird american airline what i've done <laughs> yeah because it had said that there's one variable that can explain about 90 percent. so i thought maybe it's mq and, and aa yeah american airlines i can't remember yeah. what mq stands for um but that's that's where i wanted to just check back to the full data because if if they accounted for 90 percent of all the data then that would make sense that they were 90 percent of the missing data as well um, but sure enough, that was not true. This is Ruth logic, so this might not make sense. But yeah, so AA only accounts for 10% of all the flights and MQ only accounts for 8%. So the fact that 42.9% and 48.3% of the, uh, in the missing ones made me think that that, yes, I've confirmed that link. Um, and then when you look in the documentation, it says that those two airlines report fleet numbers rather than tail numbers, which is why they can't be matched. So the carrier was the factor in common, I think. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, it said filter flights to only show flights with planes that have flown at least a hundred flights. So. Oh yeah. Was this the one that you were? Mm -hmm. Hmm? No, no. I just yeah. remember I've been trying to think about the difference between tail numbers and uh, flight numbers. Ah, uh, right, yeah. Because actually, normally, if you're dealing with uh, uh, passenger flights or like uh, demand and stuff like that, you're trying to do demand modeling, you normally look at uh, the flight numbers. Uh, right, I see. But tail numbers normally relate to a specific aircraft. In yeah, a... Alan, Alan, you are a flight man. I know, he's got <laughs> the inside knowledge here, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Oh. Well, so I used the tail numbers, rightly or wrongly, um, and so created a list of the top planes. So get rid of any without a tail number and then group what's left by the tail number, count how many times they appear, and then um, filter, because I'm only interested in ones that have flown at least 100 flights. And then I used the semi-join to filter the flights data based on just the ones that appeared in that top planes list. 
it makes a lot of sense. One, like if, especially if you're going to use this top planes data frame for anything downstream, but if not, you could also, instead of using summarize, if you use mutate, that basically doesn't collapse your group into one row. So basically what you're doing is group by tail number and now add a new column called, let's say count in this case. Um, and then you still have all of the data uh, present. And then if you do a filter like that, you don't need to do the semi-join later on. But if you're going to use this top, flame, uh, top planes data frame later on, then you know it's um, it doesn't make a difference at all. Yeah. So so Hava, uh, if if you're to use uh, summarize here, that means that uh, instead of collapsing your your rows, you're going to have the original rows as before. But uh, for example, for a specific group, you're going to, if, if it had like 10, 10 rows, then you're going to have the same count 10 times. Yeah, if you use mutate. But oh. then what you're doing is, so your original data frame with all these like 10 rows, let's say, is the flights. If you then do semi-join, you're going to get all those 10 rows back anyway. Oh, yeah. uh, so it doesn't make a difference. But again, like if sort of like this is perfectly right. It's just okay. a matter of like, let's say memory, if you needed to do this like a lot of times, or if this like, in essence, you're copying quite a lot of the data frame here. Mm. Uh, if that's not a problem, which, you know, very often it isn't, like if you're not dealing with, let's say, huge amounts of data, then it's not a problem. But it's just like, uh, I was sort of, um, this sort of, I, I found it useful when I, finally understood this sort of difference between them. So I wanted to bring it up as well here. Like whenever you're doing summarize filter, and then if you're going to do a join again, think if actually what you need is a mutate, like take this group, calculate something and then use it, but still keep the original data, which is what you're doing with the join. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Uh, so I'm trying to get my mom or my head to actually start using the mutate more instead of the summarize, because normally I use summarize then ungroup, and uh, I think sometimes it brings back the the original rows. But I like the mutate idea better. Well, mutate would keep the original rows. Summarize yeah. doesn't. Yeah, mm. that's right. Mm. I think that might be because we're in an Excel world, like you can't do that in Excel. So it's maybe a bit harder for us to get our head around. It took me a while as well because like, yeah, yeah it's just like a different, uh, I don't yeah. know, way of approaching it, I guess. But it's, it's yeah. like a super useful hack when you think about it. Like, in, you know, you don't need to join you don't, because the data is already there. Like you can still summarize and keep the original data with mutate inside a group by, which is quite useful but a bit counterintuitive sometimes. Yeah. Very, very smart, actually, I see it. Oh. <laughs> um, should I keep going? Uh, no, I think I have to go soon. Yeah, cool. Well, we've gone through most of them anyway, so. Yeah. That's oh. Really, really great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was such a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it.